Uh, welcome everybody to uh, our weekly seminar series of the Department of Marine Sciences. We're very honored to host today Professor Marit Solveig uh, Seidenkavans from Aarhus University in Denmark. Marit Solveig is a professor in marine paleoclimate at Aarhus University in Denmark. She has a PhD from uh, 1992 and has worked for some years in both Canada and France before returning to Aarhus University in 1996. Today, she is a full professor at Aarhus University where she leads a group of 10 young researchers. Her research focuses in understanding the climate system, in particular ocean circulation and its interaction with atmosphere and cryosphere. Her investi investigative tools is the study of marine sediments cores com combining geological, biological, micropaleontological, and organic and inorganic geochemical analysis. <clears throat> the application of these varied techniques allow detailed and innovative analysis of the climate system and have helped her to become a world leading expert in Holocene paleoceanography in Greenland and North Atlantic regions. <clears throat> Breakthroughs of her work include finding that climate of the last interglacial was more unstable than our present interglacial showing that 50, 55 to 70 years cyclicity of Atlantic sea surface temperature variability has existed for the last 8,000 years. Moreover, the North Atlantic Oscillation Climate sea surface changes overall mode of centennial scale and showing that off West Greenland, the ice sheet was smaller during the so-called last glacial maximum than during the otherwise less extensive ice sheet 60,000 years ago likely to do the effect of very warm ocean waters in the region 20,000 years ago. So uh, we're very honored to host you, uh, at least this time virtually, uh, Marit Solveig, uh, and we hope sincerely that you will be able to come to these latitudes. And today <clears throat> she is uh, going to uh, talk about the glacial and adolescent changes in ocean conditions and interaction with the cryosphere based on shallow seismic and marine sediments records from Northeast Greenland. So the podium is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas, and thank you very much for the invitation. I will start trying to share the screen. Hopefully this works. And if we are now we in, is it full screen now? Yeah, yeah. Perfect. So uh, thank you for the invitation again. I should to the audience apologize if I am sometimes coughing or whatever. I'm just out of a week of COVID. Uh, so, you know, some of you have probably had it, you know, it takes a little while. But still, uh, so what I would like to do today is uh, actually give you an example of one expedition that we did five years ago and what came out of this expedition and how we are still continuing working on it as an example of research that's being done. So it's not a full topic of one thing, but uh, I'm going to focus on what has come out in the relation to the deglaciation Holocene changes uh, of that uh, expedition. And the reason for we went to do you see my arrow yes perfect yes. thank you so we went to this area here of northeast greenland so you have greenland here i guess you all know where it is and we went to this area here and the reason for this was twofold one is that you see this area here of the greenland ice sheet that's called the northeast greenland ice sheet or negis that is one of the largest uh, ice streams in Greenland, and it is uh, producing a significant amount of meltwater and causing a lot of the melting of the Greenland ice sheet. It is very fast flowing, and uh, we wanted to understand the interaction between the ocean conditions out here and the Negis ice sheet. And one of those things that are in doubt was that if we go again here, and uh, we, if 
this is then the area here. And you see there are two lines here of hatched yellowish color. One here and one out here. So this is the suggested from previous literature, the suggested extent of the glacial uh, sort of the glacial ice sheet during the last glacial maximum about 20,000 years ago. And you can see one suggests that the ice sheet went all the way out to the shelf break and the other one that it only went a little bit off the coast. And understanding whether it's one or the other or something very third is very important for understanding the ice dynamics. We know from other places that the ice sheet, not everywhere during the last glacial maximum was as big as, as expected, but uh, here we basically know very little. And understanding this is important for uh, evaluating the quality of models, for instance, also modeling of the future ice sheet. So this is one of the reasons for going there. The other is that the Northeast Greenland area here is located right at the edge of the Fram Strait. So the Fram Strait is this gateway between the Arctic Ocean and the Greenland, Iceland, Norwegian Sea, or the very northern part of the North Atlantic. It is the largest gateway of water exchange between uh, these southern areas and uh, the Arctic. There is a second gateway over here through the Canadian Arctic, but it's not nearly as big. And then there's also uh, the Bering Sea gateway, but there it's mainly water from the Pacific flowing into the Arctic and not uh, the uh, Arctic water going out. And to understand this link here between with red are marked warm waters coming from the Atlantic at subsurface levels, some hundred meters down in the uh, below the uh, below the sea surface, so Atlantic type water, and here is a colder surface polar water, uh, and that interchange with some of the Arctic water going all up, Atlantic water going all in way into the Arctic Ocean, mixing with colder waters and going out here as Arctic Atlantic um, water. So we have both Atlantic warm water going in and somewhat colder going out and also very cold ice loaded water going out. This interchange between the Fram Strait has significant impact on the uh, Atlantic meridional overturning circulation and therefore on the uh, global climates because this fresh, the export of ice and fresh water impacts the amount of deep, sea for, uh, deep water formation in this area here. So it's really important to understand this and what has happened here. Uh, also, of course, this is the water masses that influences the ice that goes out into uh, the fjords here and therefore also influence the ice sheet. So this is the overall uh, circulation pattern. If we go in and detail, then you can see, see the topography here. So here you have land again. Oops, that was a little bit fast. So, and here you have two major ice streams, the 79 uh, North Glacier and the Zakaria Ice Stream Glacier. Those are the main ice streams. And then we have the water uh, going from the outer shelf towards the, uh, uh, the coastline through some deeper troughs. Sea level or the water depths are in the central area here. That's only about 150 meters, and there's no warm water or very little warm water passing through there. But here we are at several hundred meters water depth, and there we can get warm water all the way to the ice sheet, with mainly the really warm water going in the southern trench and colder water from the Arctic in the northern trench. And to understand this interchange, how was that happening in the past? This is our second goal. You can see here in detail uh, the where the warm water, this is a transect in the north, 
up here. So we had here quite close to the northern trench. The southern one here is closer to the southern trench, but going across the intertrench area. But you can see here with red, these are the warm waters that come at subsurface level at some hundred meters water depth and uh, reach the coast here. Above that, we have still have the very cold uh, ice filled waters. And you see that also here in the south, uh, that it doesn't go reach all out here. That's simply because we are at too shallow and the water would go this way and not across here. But it just shows that it's not warm water on top and cold cooling down. You actually have really cold water on top, low salinity cold water. Then we have higher salinity warm water, and then we get into intermediate uh, types of water below. That's also shown here with surface water, the cold polar water, and then the warmer Atlantic water in the CTD. So these were the two um, topics we were looking at. So the extent of the ice sheet during the last glacial maximum and uh, the uh, changes in ocean circulation. We are focusing here on the deglaciation and the Holocene period. If any of you are in doubt when I speak about something, uh, do speak up if you, for instance, oh, I don't know when was the Holocene, for instance, I assume that's not an issue, but still, right? Uh, don't uh, be afraid of, of asking questions. So we went to this area here with this ship. Uh, this is a Danish research vessel, which is soon to be decommissioned because it's 40 years old and it could not handle real sea ice conditions, uh, just sort of more open water with a little bit of uh, sea ice. Um, let me see, I need to, now it's moving, yeah. So, the, it, however, it's very nice to have all these plans. What do you want to go there? We wanted to do uh, shallow seismic, scoring and so on. But when you get there in real life, we sailed from, then it's not quite so easy. We sailed from Langeyabun in Svalbard, so north of, uh, of mainland Norway. And we sailed out with a gale, sort of gales of 14 to 17 knots. And this was what we were experiencing. It doesn't look so bad over there, but we were not really cutting through the waves. It was just like that. And there was nothing we could do. We had originally planned to take samples out in the Fram Strait already, but we basically had to give up because there was nothing we could do. The ship was rolling horrendously. And when the, the weather is like that, you can't put any kind of gear overboard. So I decided, I was cruise leader and I told the captain, he said, he said well, we are now at station, what should we do? I said, what can we do? Nothing, he says, well, get into the ice or closer to the, to the coast. So we had to give up some of the stations. Then there's another issue when you're working in the Arctic, that's the sea ice. And since we had a, a ship that could handle up to, in principle, up to a meter of ice, but because of we had an inner mast sticking down below, it couldn't handle that much. Also, it wasn't a breaking ice, it could only push ice. That meant that we really had to be careful about where to go. So the middle map here shows the ice situation uh, on uh, Approximately day we sailed off, we chose to go in September because September is where we have least sea ice. And all marked in red is full heavy sea ice cover with orange and yellow is less, with blue and green is sort of, well, maybe we can work there situation. But that's of course not really, you need more details. So for every day we paid to have the Danish Met Meteorological Office send us a ice chart. And that's what you see to the right, where in blue is marked the coastline. You can't really, it's not that easy to see, 
but then all this whitey stuff out here is sea ice. And they uh, marked here with green the lines where there was sea ice. And in principle, we were up here that day and we needed to go down there. And in principle, if you followed the map here, we would have to go all the way out there like this and use two days on that. Luckily, we had an experienced ice pilot on board. It's basically a high person who was hired in to just look for icebergs and ice sea ice. And he said, oh, you can go through here. Well, that's not an issue. But still, it's something we had to take into account all the time. And that meant that originally, the map to the left shows where we had plans on doing stations. Some just CTDs. Uh, but many of them to do coring, you see, for instance, this one we had to give up immediately. We did manage to not do this, but a little bit closer in and so on. And so to the right, you see the map of the sail line in purple, where we did the uh, sub bottom profiler and with yellow are marked stations, not all are sediment cores, some are also just CTDs and so on. And that showed Sort of, we try to follow the plan, but the plan only works until you get into the field and then you make a plan from day to day. So these are the backgrounds. Then, of course, we went out, we did, had to do, or we had an Inomar to do a shallow seismics. Um, we wanted to have a no, what's called a multi beam, but that was not on the ship. So we had to live with that. And in principle, we had sort of hoped to find nice data like the ones you see here to the right. That was, however, not the case. This is what we got. And for those of you who have looked at seismic data, you will know, well, this is not really very good for coring, right? So there's a lot of places where there's no sediment. And then we had some areas here with sediments. So we had to really use the, the uh, sub bottom profiler to find proper coring sites because there really weren't very many of them. What we did was choose, of course, to go to the places where the water depth was higher because the chances of finding sediments in holes uh, in, in basins there are higher then uh, you won't find much in shallow water in the shallow areas so that's basically just swept by the currents but still it was not necessarily an easy task so the uh, uh, seismic work was done during night and i told the seismic people that we had to start coring at station or to do the work at station at eight o'clock in the morning by that time they should have found one or two sites in the air target area, but sometimes we actually had to go a little bit longer. And uh, also, they we couldn't get high, as high resolution uh, seismic data as they would have liked uh, on all the stretches, because we also had to move quite long distances. We did sail 2000 kilometers, and so we had to go seven to eight knots a lot of the time. And that was not very popular by, among the seismic people. We did, of course, go slower in, in target areas, but still. So we also, when you do go at sea, you also need the present water um, content and, uh, and, and see basically what the water masses are and so on, because it's nice to, well, it's been, there are some few data before and we had sort of a general idea but it's not the same as getting a high resolution data set. So we collected water samples and CTDs uh, from a number of sites and combined with uh, a previous cruise to the south uh, of our area, uh, we, we got a number of samples and currently there is a PhD student working on uh, sort of the modern hydrography. I won't get further into that. It's just to, to remind you that this is one of the things we always have to do. Okay, so coring, we did uh, gravity coring and some rumor 
uh, core in which is basically a short gravity core. And we were reasonably lucky. Uh, many of the cores were quite short because it seems that the soft package was only a few meters thick, but we did get up to a six meter long cores a few places. And that's not much if, if any of you are working with IODP material, but it's a very different technique. And on the course, we've been working on micropalantology, fornifera, dinoflagellates, diatoms were unfortunately absent, uh, XRF core scanning, uh, magnetic susceptibility, biomarkers, uh, ADNA, calcium carbonate, TUC, and so on, as well, of course, as you always do, grain size analysis, analysis of ice rafted debris, and radiogenic uh, dating. So to the actual results. So go here, uh, the extent of the ice sheet, we could actually look at that based on one core, which is this one here on the larger map, it's marked here, which is very close to the ice edge. And that core, if we look at this, it's, it was only 150 centimeters long, but it contained marine sediments down here with uh, bryozoans, bivalves, fornifera, and so on uh, in this area here. And you can see that it's dated to something between 19 and 25,000 years. So right smack in the middle of the last glacial maximum. And if we look at it the, in details, you have here the uh, foraminifera. So here you have two species of benthic foraminifera indicating a strong influx of, a, of high saline Atlantic water. And you have the dates again here. But you can also see there's not much going on. They are all just there in this more or less the equal numbers. So they seem quite mixed and there is also some mixing of the dates. So we interpret this as a glacial marine deposit during the last glacial maximum, but it was mixed up by icebergs at the time. So it's a so-called iceberg turbid. But it does show that at this site, Going back here, there was no ice right here. However, there are a number of ice scour marks here and also here and so on, indicating that there was ice further out than here. What we can see, we can see that on the, our seismic data and so on. We just don't have anything dated that goes so far back in time up here. However, if we go to the southern area, like here, so the previous core was here, and we go to this area here, this uh, the southern trough, or the, called the Norske trough. There we have uh, a number of cores, one, two, three here, and there is also some data from a published core up here. And there is one core here that is from a group in Durban that is not yet published. I haven't seen the data, I just know of their results. Uh, and they say that they start having marine conditions at 19,000, that before then there was a, a glacier. But we have data from these cores here. And there we can compare the seismic data we have here. We have, for instance, some places where we have iceberg plow marks, we have sediment infill, and we have glacial lineations. And combining those data with the cores, uh, so here you have the seismic profiles very close to the location uh, where the cores are. The cores are marked here in red. So we have three core sites and four sites with seismic data. And they can be correlated here with reflectors, the green, uh, reflector B, the blue reflector A, and the yellow reflector A mark. And we can here see that in this area here, in the what's called pale pink color, 
This we interpret as a subglacial till, or at least a subglacial diamectin. Let's be more uh, sort of less precise. And above that, we have uh, glacier marine conditions. First, we have laminated conditions, laminated sediments that can show that we have uh, we had a um, a glacier uh, sort of a, uh, the ice, a floating ice sheet uh, above, and then more open conditions afterwards. And using these data uh, from these sites, what we can do is look and make an interpretation of the retreat of the ice. So what is not included is the, where's my error? mouse day was, the uh, data from the core from the Durban group out here. Uh, but we can see that there are uh, some lineations and so on, but we do know that around 16,000, this area had become deglaciated. Around something like 14,000, but certainly before 12 and a half thousand, <laughs> yeah. This area here uh, became glaciated. Between here and there, the ice sheet rested on this glacial um, uh, wedge here. Um, this, this is a grounding zone wedge, and the rest, the ice sheet rested here for several thousand years from retreating from here to here. And then from when it disappeared here, um, no later than 12 and a half thousand years ago, it retreated past here and on to uh, the in under land within a few hundred years. So this appearance here is as early as 13 and a half thousand years and, and but no later than 12 and a half. And that shows that the ice movement or the retreat was really stepwise. So first, it were a relatively slow retreat, and it, it stayed here for a long time, and then it just collapsed. Within a few hundred years, it had retreated uh, a few hundred uh, kilometers. Now, going on to the oceanography, then we have here, uh, then looking at the changes in ocean circulation based on the actual sediment cores. So here are a, some of the cores that we've been looking at. There are a few extras, uh, but I, I'm, of course, I'm not going to show you data for all of them. Uh, but you can see they are spread out in the area. And I remind you again that we have this in the area, we have polar surface waters, which is a fresh water uh, from the ice sheets that are also warmed in summertime due to some, so basically the sun. Below that, we have the polar water from the Arctic Ocean. And below that, again, we have Atlantic water, partly uh, recirculating through the uh, Atlantic Ocean partly coming directly from Svalbard. So for the cores, we did CT scanning on many of them. And that is extremely helpful when you want to understand what's going on. Not only do you detect if you have suddenly have slumps you couldn't see with a naked eye, uh, this core was luckily free of that, but you can also see something like here. In the bottom, so that's my mouse it is there so over here <laughs> sorry that here we have uh, a diamectin so this is the very bottom this core i should mention is this one up here right off the ice sheet or located here so the ice sheet is here but all this is heavy sea ice so this was the furthest we could get in and here, this we, we interpret this as here the ice was grounded at that time. Then the sediment comp becomes laminated. 
They are so laminated you could see it with the naked eye, but it becomes much more clear here with the in the CT scans that we interpret as deposited under a floating ice shelf. Because if you have the ice shelf that floats on top, uh, the uh, uh, you will have less mixing <coughs> down to the seafloor. Uh, and you will, don't, won't have bioturbation because there's not so much oxygen. So it's typical what you see below a floating ice shelf. Then you come to this area here where you have bioturbation. So the ice shelf would have retreated here. We would uh, get more, uh, more mixing of the waters. You get uh, more life on the seafloor. Then it becomes uh, somewhat uh, laminated again. Here's a minor fault, as you can see. Uh, and it varies a bit uh, with biodivation going in and out uh, until here, where we get generally stronger biodivation and open more open water conditions. It doesn't mean that there was no sea ice whatsoever, but uh, there's a big difference whether you have a thick ice sheet on top, even if it's floating, or if you have sea ice. You can also see with white are marked uh, drop stones. So the core here was dated using carbon-14 dates. The lowest part we couldn't date because even though there were foraminifera in the laminated parts showing it was certainly marine, there were very few. Had sedimentation rates were high and Generally, life, of course, wasn't so good when the, you only have relatively low oxygen at the seafloor. And that meant that it was really, really difficult to find enough material for dating. But the lowest date here, uh, the lowest dated date is 12 and a half thousand years. If we then interpolate further on, we get a bottom date above the uh, diamectin at 13.4. A thousand years ago, but that is, of course, just a guesstimate because you don't know if we had the constant sedimentation rates. And you see here, uh, up till about 8,000 years ago, we had a significant change in sedimentation rate. Just a moment. <laughs> oh, sorry. And this is interpreted as uh, being caused by, and uh, here we still had in the lowest part until 8,000 years ago, the ice was still relatively close to the coast and caused uh, significant uh, sedimentation out into the uh, basin. But up here in the last 8,000 years, uh, we had less melting from the glacier. Looking at, yeah, you can see that here too, where you have the also the grain sizes in the 8,000 years here, we have coarser grain size down here and finer up there. I think I, I said all what I wanted to say here anyway. Okay, so the uh, foraminifera, uh, benthic foraminifera with red, don't worry about the names, but I can say that with red and with uh, orange are uh, shown warm water species, meaning uh, input of Atlantic water. Uh, it doesn't mean that we don't also have polar water coming in, but we still have a significant influx of Atlantic water there. And around 8,000, that uh, decreases a lot. So don't worry about the other parts. So that means that our interpretation for this specific area here is, as you see the cartoon here uh, on the top, we had in the deglaciation phase, sort of late, uh, late mist too, and uh, very early Holocene, we had a floating ice shelf with influx of both Atlantic water and polar water going under, especially Atlantic water under, going underneath. This would have warmed and melted the ice from below here 
and caused a rapid retreat. Uh, so by 11,000 approximately, the ice had gone uh, to an island road that we see out here in these maps here. It did extend for uh, 800 years again further out. That's when the second period of laminated sediments before it fully retreated. And at one point it actually retreated uh, at 8,000 to behind the present line. Since for the last few hundred years, the ice has ex uh, extended further out into towards the coast again since. If we go here uh, close to the end, uh, further up north to this area here, to the Northern Trench, uh, this is an area where we had much more sea ice, um, but it is, and we had some difficulties getting there, but because it is also a pollinia, so it's an area where there's very often sort of a pool of open water, you just have to get to it, uh, we managed to get uh, our northernmost core, and there because we are far from the coast and are not disturbed by the a glacier that is melting, uh, we can see that we had here again with red and marked the warm water species. And we had a strong Atlantic water influx here until 7,000 years ago. It become less and today it's even less. So during the early Holocene, we had stronger influx of Atlantic water than we have today. Uh, I think I'll drop that one. Uh, and the final core, which the previous one was up here, the first one was there, and then here in the middle, one more core that also shows that un until here, until 6,000 years ago, with red again, the warmest species, we had stronger influx of Atlantic water, but here in the middle part of the shelf, where in principle, we shouldn't find much Atlantic water, but because of eddy work, eddy is bringing in the water all the time from the open uh, the Fram Strait, we do get Atlantic water all the way. And this is the only core where we have good sedimentation rates all through the Holocene. So you can see that we have, I showed you three different sites with some similarities, just looking at the red curves, but also quite a lot of dissimilarities. So three different sites and diff three different areas that are really not fully correlated in a small area. If you go to two sites in the North Gotrafford alone, the same area there, they do correlate, but not here between the troughs and, and in the middle part. And it just shows that uh, the pattern we see is really complicated. Still, uh, we can see uh, some general patterns. So if we make conclusions on the two uh, main topics that we st are studying is that the Greenland ice sheet did not reach the ice shelf everywhere during the last glacial maximum, but probably it did reach the ice shelf somewhere. The uh, retreat ha started very early on. Uh, so deglaciation it did certainly start prior to 16,000 years ago. And we can see that uh, from the seafloor landforms, uh, that there was uh, some grounding zone complex, both uh, between the uh, sort of uh, close to, to the ice shelf, the shelf break, sorry, uh, where it probably went uh, during the last glacial maximum, but also a clear gr grounding zone uh, sort of in the middle of the shelf where the ice rested for quite a long time. Uh, so. Our data show that the uh, ice sheet uh, after the deglacia or during the deglaciation, it retreated from the somewhere in the outer part of the shelf to the middle shelf uh, in stepwise. Parts of the retreat was very fast and other parts 
were basically and still stand for thousands of years. With the total deglaciation likely uh, happening uh, prior to 13 uh, and a half thousand years ago, or 13.4, but certainly before 12 and a half thousand years ago. For the second part, the, the uh, oceanography, uh, the uh, uh, deglaciation that we saw before, it occurred simultaneously with a rapid expansion of Atlantic sourced water, so the warm water coming at seafloor level, uh, sea, and that we are cannot still will be 100% sure that the rapid retreat was due to the warm water, but it is something we are further looking further into. We can just say, well, it did happen and it did coincide, so that might be it might be a cause. About seven and a half to eight thousand years ago, this flux of Atlantic water was reduced, and at the same time um, uh, we got more cold water to the bottom. Part of it might have been due to a less Atlantic water flowing in, but part of it may also be because we have more mixing, uh, because there was not so much stratification from the melting glaciers. And we can see in today's physical oceanography data that there is Atlantic water coming in, but we can also from the foraminifera see that it was not nearly as strong, is not nearly as strong today that it was during the early Holocene. Yeah. So this is an example of how you can use a combination of seismic data, uh, water or water analysis and sediment cores to try to get a full picture. But we are still not fully done. We worked on it for five years and we are not done yet. But uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Marit Solveig. Really, really uh, interesting. And what a, what a chance to work in such a complex uh, environment and not to mention the weather conditions. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I do open the, the podium for questions from the audience uh, since I don't uh, see anyone. I can here. stop so sharing, just, then you can see people. <laughs> so just uh, jump into the pop up and ask questions. Well, until they don't 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 be shy. My story doesn't bite. It's okay. No, <laughs> not yet. Uh, I do have a for the minute, I do have a question. Sorry. Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, you you mentioned the radiocarbon. I just wonder, um, just for uh, the audience also, what actually you obtain out of the sediment for doing the C fourteen dating. Mm. Is it yeah. Or it's, yeah. yeah, we we basically when you are working in the Arctic, we face the problem that there is very little carbon, and it can be very difficult to date anything. Uh, so basically, what we are doing is we date anything we can find. So the first thing you, we do when we open the cores, if we find any shells, off they go. <laughs> in one core. Uh, there we had um, bryozoans. I've never uh, so re really nice and fragile bryozoans, so they were clear, and we've never had that before. But most of the time, we use formifera when we can. We try to use both bentics and planktics in two different samples. Never ever combine them unless there is hopeless to find enough material, because the planktic foraminifera live in the surface waters, which generally has one age, and the benthic foraminifera live at the bottom waters when can at a very different age. So we normally use foraminifera. We have seen several times that bivalves, shells, give an older age than the foraminifera, so uh, we we I've become more and more worried about using bivalves, uh, but sometimes this is the only thing you can do. We have also been lucky that we found a lab in Zurich that can do very very small samples, samples that would never have been possible just ten years ago. So mm -hmm. this work here, 
10, 15 years ago, we would just have been able to say, well, nice chorus. There are some changes into formnifera, but had no idea what the age was. Mm -hmm. And now okay. we get really nice dates sometimes. Yeah, they, there is uncertainty range if samples are really, really small. But earlier, I can say for those of you who are have been working on dates, in order to get enough material, I previously easily picked eight to 10,000 for omnifera just for one date. Now 50 to 100 for omnifera is enough. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, Gabriel has a question. a question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Gabriel has a question. Please go ahead. Yeah. Th thank you very much, um, Marit, for the presentation. Uh, the, you showed us a map somewhere from the start, one of the cartoon that you showed about uh, the, the ice advancement and retreats. Uh, I actually, my question is about the, the, the ice dynamics, but mm -hmm. if you can play back to the slide, I like to ask a question there. I because will try. I don't know. And, oops. Yes, you, you passed, you just passed that. <laughs> that one? No, the one before. No, no. Mm -hmm. You oh, said sorry. map. You didn't mean map then. Okay, yeah, something like cartoon you showed, not this. Ah, oh, the cartoon. Yes, the cartoon. This one and the cartoon. Two that of one. Them. Mm -hmm. Is that the yes. one you mean? Yes, this one. Mm -hmm. And I, I actually wanted to know like the direction of uh, the CIF, uh, the ice dynamics one, maybe how you, 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 you resolve it because uh, looking at the ice retreating towards the coastline after 16,000 years, and you mentioned in part of the uh, uh, Flaminifera's uh, analysis done about the correlation. Mm -hmm. So what, I mean, if the correlations from the North and the South, I don't know if they all worked hand in hand, but how do you play with the, see the ice dynamics? Is it going North or South or Westward as coastline? Ah. I think I understand now your question. See, I, the core that we are working at is this one here. Here's okay. another core that has been published before. And here are some of our cores. And the numbers you see here uh, are, are basically uh, sort of uh, shown uh, here, this is when it became, we know it became ice free, uh, at least that by that time. So we do have some other sites and also here on land, you can see there are some areas here. And that's because on land, there were both lake studies and also cosmogenic isotope uh, studies of the bedrocks that show the time period when uh, the area became ice free or at least sort of, uh, it's certainly, it's sort of like a minimum age. Uh, and so the ice, Sorry. the ice moves uh, through the uh, uh, streams here and likely into here, but we are not sure actually if the ice moved between the islands or if the ice stream was actually this one going, oops, going here. We cannot see that. Uh, mm. So we don't know that for absolutely sure if it's this ice here or that one here. However, currently, this is the biggest ice stream and this 79 North ice stream seems to be cutting off and dying off. But mm. we cannot be sure. Mm. Okay. I so wish, because... it were. not yet. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I do, I mean, felt maybe with that, uh, 
I know because I saw the the seismic data, the shallow seismic data wasn't so so funny or interesting to to really look at. That would have really helped in my own thought. I, I think if you are able to get shallow seismic around that zone, then compare. Yeah, that is true. But uh, this this marked here. This is the. Oh, is the uh, this site here, we couldn't get for any further towards the ice because it was heavy sea ice. Mm. The reason why there are, is a core here mm. is because the year before, the, the Polarstern, which is a German icebreaker, went there. But oh. we don't have an icebreaker, and I couldn't afford renting an <laughs> icebreaker because one of the issues, when I talked about the weather conditions and so on, to be honest, the biggest issue uh, when you do want to do field work is to get the money for it. Mm, yes. And uh, yeah. Uh, so so uh, so that was uh, yeah, and you can't just go and rent the polar stand, for instance. Uh, mm. So so, but I I do agree. It would be nice to have a lot more seismic data, and this is the hope for the future. <laughs> Okay, I hope you get more grants for that. So <laughs> yeah, get something. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gabriel. I think that Isik wants to ask a question. Yeah, hi. I'm sorry if it's a bit noisy. I'm driving. Um, Thank you. It was uh, an exciting talk. Very beautiful result with the crisis of the melting water and uh, and definitely a challenging work. Um, I have a few questions. Uh, I don't know. Maybe I, I'm failing the understanding. Why, why do you think there is no? You said that there are no sediments. Can you can you explain that that statement? Where are the sediments? Uh, what is imaged there at the seafloor? Sorry, it seemed to. Could you hear me? It's not that there are no sediments, uh, except for, well, in the shallow sites, uh, if that's what you mean, sort of where we have about 150 meters water depth, the currents are so strong that you basically have no deposition. We took a dredge sample, for instance, it was just glacial sediments. Uh, we have, so there we have a few cores from uh, sort of small depressions. And in one, we managed to get half a meter of sediment. And the other one, it was better because it was a deep depression. But we, this is a generally a problem around Greenland that there are very, very strong currents and you can only find sediment deposited in depressions. If that is, is that what you asked about? Yeah, so, so you're saying basically what is there is, is leftovers from what the, the current sipped away, either by no deposition or removal. Yeah, I but, think but most, of the, most of the time it's by non-deposition. So we are lucky when you have basically a ba basin that's are filled out uh, because the currents slow down a little bit, right, uh, in the basins. That's why we get the sediment dep deposition. Then, then the base, the, the sediments that are in the basin, you treat them as a, as deposited in situ, but but you could really have a long distance transport of the sediments. This is the in this kind of an environment. Yeah, we do have some transport. There is no doubt of it. Uh, and of course, um, but the good thing about when you do many radiocarbon dates is that if you have a nice series of constant uh, sort of um, sort of changes in, in, in sediment, you can see that it's not a major issue. But there are some intervals in some of the cores uh, where in the deglaciation phase, uh, we have Pliocene from Nifra, for instance. So we can see that there was a lot of reworking in parts of it. Those ones we are, have to treat with 
significant care. And of course, we cannot be 100% sure that there is no other reworking, but it would be reworking from the same time period because it was not Marine Corps. And if you go back to the previous Marine periods, which would be the last interglacial, there I can see that it's not the same species you find. Right, but then, but then uh, you should take a little bit uh, caution interpreting the uh, the spatial distribution of species because you may be getting species from somewhere else to be deposited in the site that you were occurring. Well, we are actually also looking at the present distribution of the uh, species. Uh, some are stained, so in principle living. Others oh, not. Mm. Uh, and there we can see that a significant part of the present foraminifera that are there are actually stained because we have a significant problems about dissolution today. But uh, that it does show that there are a lot of the same species are living there today. But it is always a problem when you work with any kind of marine environments, right? Where you have currents, sediment may be transported, fossils may be transported and so on. But you look at the quality of the specimens, see are they in pristine condition? Uh, do, uh, and and uh, consider what are the risks of reworking because they cannot be reworked from, for instance, the shallow water areas, because it wouldn't be the same species there anyway, because it's a different water mass also. But you're right, we always have to bear that in mind every time we work in marine environment. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Marit Solveig. Um, if nobody has uh, another question, so I think that we will uh, end. And I hope that you, because we are late, and I hope that you will feel better and that you're already feeling better after the COVID. Thank you. Okay. And thank you all for listening. So thank you very much, Marit. And I, with, I sincerely hope to, to meeting you soon as well. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay,